Welcome to My Therapist Says, an interactive experiencing enriching your most important relationships. I'll be your host and moderator as we present, What Do You Do for Comfort? Looking at our God-given need for comfort and where it goes wrong. In a few moments, Dr. David Levy will provide keen insights into how to apply healthy comfort to your life. As a dear friend of mine and a regular presenter on this broadcast, Dr. Levy is a neurosurgeon who practiced high-risk neurosurgery for more than 20 years, specialized in surgery of the blood vessels of the brain. Dr. Levy attended medical school at Emory University in Atlanta. After completing a fellowship at the University of Vienna, Austria, Dr. Levy was one of the first neurosurgeons in the United States to be double specialized in endovascular neurosurgery, performing minimally invasive surgery on brain vessels without opening the head, entering through the femoral artery in the patient's leg. In his book, Gray Matter, a neurosurgeon discovers the power of prayer once a patient at a time, published by Tyndall House, details the dramatic intersection of medicine and faith as it chronicles patient experiences, both good and bad, the power of forgiveness, as well as Dr. David Levy's journey of faith. Dr. Levy was appointed clinical professor of neurosurgery at University of California, San Diego from 2013 to 2017. He speaks on topics of neuroscience and presents God's wisdom as pertinent and powerful today. Using his knowledge of the Bible and the brain, Dr. Levy's vision is to reveal God's wisdom in a fresh and engaging way, helping people understand God as good and desires relationship. When stressed and distracted, it is difficult to connect and enjoy relationship with God or anyone else. In a world of increasing noise, Dr. Levy is creating exercises to quiet and focus the mind. Developing healthy relationships with God, self, and others should bring clarity, joy, peace as God intended. Today's broadcast takes place before a live audience and live streaming while offering practical biblical solutions. It's like having your own Christian medical doctor and medical health relationship doctor within the comforts of your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we connect with a live audience and My Therapist Says. Well, Dr. David Levy, we welcome you this evening. So glad that you're here with us once again at My Therapist Says. It's good to be here, Don. Would Thank you join you. me in welcoming Dr. David Levy? <clears throat> So good to be here talking about a topic everyone is an expert in, comfort. Where do you go for comfort? Of course, we're going to be talking a little about comfort foods. One of the things I became aware of regarding comfort foods is that if you eat too many comfort foods, you can actually buy a waistband of your pants. It's called the comfort sizer. It looks like a typical button or snap, but there's elastic built in so that you can eat those comfort foods and still feel comfortable. I want to start out talking about comfort, telling you some stories, my experience with comfort or lack of comfort. And then we're going to switch, and I want to talk about how God wants to give us comfort. You see, if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you would like to be comforted by God? I would imagine most of the hands would go up. And if I were to follow that question with, how many of you on a regular basis are used to receiving the comfort of God, I would imagine few hands would go up. And so the last thing we want to talk about this evening is what's the block? Why, what keeps us from receiving the comfort of God? We want it, but what are the things that, that seem to be blocking it? Well, I'll start off by telling you two stories from my life. The first one takes place when I was 10, 11 years old. 
I was sitting in class, and the girl in front of me, I'll call her Sally, she used to lean back, and her hair would kind of come very close to my desk, and I would sort of brush it with my hand a bit. And I just became very attracted to Sally. I never actually spoke to her. (laughs) (laughs) But I remember having 11-year-old fantasies of rescuing Sally from the bad guys, kind of that dream. And then Valentine's Day came around. And in my school growing up, there were about 30 people in our class. And the tradition was everyone made a little shoebox, Valentine box, decorated it, and then everyone put a Valentine in everyone else's box. Well, I got the great idea. I was going to give Sally a very special Valentine. So with great 11-year-old courage, I wrote those three words, I love you, and I signed my name. And then I put that in her Valentine box, and I was so looking forward to her reaction. She had to go through quite a few Valentines (laughs) to get to mine, but I was expecting her to read it, turn around, clutch it to her chest, and say thank you. (laughs) I feel the same way about you. But Sally stood up, and she went over to the girl next to her, tapped her on the shoulder, and showed her this card. How do I know it was mine? Because the girl turned around and looked at me, (laughs) put her hand over her mouth, and then started laughing. I was mortified. I I wished that I could have been invisible. Fortunately, it was (laughs) the last period of the day. And so I went home very dejected. I remember going outside the house, sort of leaning against the side of the house, and saying these words, nobody loves me, everybody hates me. And I remember it still to this day, I remember it, that a a feeling of power, of somehow justice, somehow strength came into me saying those words, that is self-pity. Very powerful. And very powerful to move you away from God. And it started me on a path, it planted seeds. I believe when we say things like that, when we make statements like that, it actually gives the kingdom of evil a chance to come into your life and say, you are right. I I mean, those words are music to to the ears of those in the kingdom of evil. First of all, they're lies, bold faced lies. But it's how I felt. And we're gonna be talking this evening about the difference between your feelings and reality. It's very important when you're seeking comfort to know the difference between your feelings, which are frequently wrong. Frequently your feelings are not representing the truth, particularly the truth of God. I wish that I could have gone to my parents, but perhaps like some of you, by the time I was 11, my parents were not sources of comfort for me. I was worried it would be some, some teasing or some dismissal or some shame. Why did you do a stupid thing like that? So I decided to just take care of this on my own. And what I really wish is that my parents, in raising me, would have told me, you have a heavenly father who wants to comfort you. I wonder if he knows how you feel. I wonder if your heavenly father has ever had someone that he really loved 
and he wanted them to know it. And he demonstrated it in an act of great courage. But that act of love was not received. I wonder how he feels. You see, when we have these powerful emotions, what we need to ask ourselves, does the Father understand how I feel? Because we, before we go to comfort, it's a good idea to get validated. Most of us want validation. Does anyone understand how I'm feeling? Well, as a matter of fact, those are perfectly normal emotions you're having after a rejection. Probably even more than a rejection because this woman, this girl, instead of keeping it to herself, decided to show it to her friend. It was a bit of gossip. And I received that as a betrayal. Wouldn't it have been nice if my parents would have taught me, hey, I wonder if Jesus knows anything about betrayal. I wonder if he knows what it's like to to really care about people and have them do things that are for their own interests. Oh, as a matter of fact, Jesus knows plenty about betrayal. And the Father knows a tremendous about, about, tremendous, the Father knows a tremendous amount about rejection to the tune of millions and millions. But the truth, the truth is it's so often, so often, like I was doing. I took my feelings, my circumstances, as reality. The reality is that not nobody loves me. The reality is I have never not been loved. From the time I was in my mother's womb, I was loved. Whether or not I was wanted, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit wanted me delighted to see me, delighted to walk with me, even before I knew them. I have never been unloved. You see, we interpret our circumstances as a measuring stick of God's love for us. We interpret our circumstances as the measuring stick of God's love for us, but the measuring stick of anyone's love for you is what they will do to preserve the relationship or to have a relationship with you. And in the case of our father, the price he was willing to pay to have a relationship with you and with me was to send his son. And the price that Jesus was willing to pay was a tremendous amount of suffering and death. That is the measuring stick of God's love for me. Not if the girl in front of me said hello or thank you to my valentine. But I continued. That I did, at that point, plant some seeds in my life using self-pity. It seemed to, to work well for me. And so I'll fast forward many years after that story, I went through a breakup in a relationship that I had wanted to work. And I went right down to the grocery store, and I bought six large cartons of ice cream, six different flavors of ice cream, so much ice cream I had difficulty getting it into my freezer. I had to really arrange the, the peas and the frozen foods and I started eating ice cream every night, and on the weekends, morning, noon, and night, I would eat ice cream and I would watch sad movies, romantic comedies. <laughs> so I began believing that the people on the screen were portraying life as it really was. And it made me feel surprisingly even worse. Everyone else in TV land had someone but me. And if they had problems in their relationship, they were able to work them out in the next half an hour. Why not me? And as I indulged myself in my ice cream eating and self-pity, 
I began to have these other thoughts. You see, self-pity is not... Self-pity is, I believe, the counterfeit Holy Spirit. The the Holy Spirit is a comforter. But the self-pity says, let me comfort you. You deserve better. God is not treating you well. He's not watching out for you. He clearly doesn't care about you, so you need to get it on your own. Go out and get it on your own. Whether it's a drink, whether it's a drug, whether it's someone to use, you don't have to wait around for God. You can make it happen yourself. And I recognize that voice. It's not my voice but the voice of evil. That I was going to think of using someone else. That's not who I want to be. That's not who I'm, no matter what happens to me, I am not going to use someone else and justify it because someone has hurt me. And so I recognize that my self-pity party was not working. And what really saved me in that adventure or misadventure was that I actually took a mission trip to Mexico. And there's nothing to snap you out of a pity party like seeing people who are much worse off than you. People who have real needs. And I began to serve others, and I began to bless them, and I began to recognize how blessed I am. (laughs) Well, let's talk a little bit about the biologic origins of comfort. It happens even in the womb. We know from studying babies in the womb that they know, I mean, if noises are too loud, they will kick, they... There's some research that shows in babies who are being carried by women who smoke, if the mother thinks about having a cigarette, the baby's heart rate goes up. Well, why would that be? Well, cigarette smoke decreases your oxygen saturation. Would that be uncomfortable for a baby? Oh, yeah. Yet they don't like to be uncomfortable. And then we're born. And how much effort do we make to try to keep a newborn comfortable? The right temperature, the right food, oh, shiny things to dangle in front of them, whatever you can do to try to distract them to make sure that they are as comfortable as possible or at least stop crying. And then the greatest comfort to most newborns are nursing, breastfeeding. They get tremendous comfort being there with the mother. Now, it's interesting that some of the problems can start here because the bond between mother and child, the biological, neurological bond, takes place at this time. The mother looking at the child, the mother staring into the eyes of the child, blessing the baby, talking to the child. But many mothers, and perhaps this happened to you, see this as typically just just a feeding time. And they're texting, surfing the web, watching a show, and they're not focusing on the child. They're not bonding with the child You see, comfort is meant to be found in relationship. And if you can't get it in a relationship, you're going to get it in food. If the mother is not pouring into you who you are and how delighted she is to be with you, it would not be surprising that you would be susceptible to wanting to seek comfort from food. And then we grow a little more, three, four, five years old. 
we fall, we skin our knee. Or perhaps we're out in a public place on a baseball field and we're running the bases and we fall and we skin our knee and then we have a a physical pain but we also have an emotional embarrassment. We tripped and we need someone to comfort us for physical pain and for emotional pain. It's possible some of us didn't receive that or instead of comfort we We heard, you know, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Don't be a baby. And we learn not to show weakness. We learn not to. We learn not to let ourselves be vulnerable, to need comfort. If you're a real man, you don't need comfort. But then we find all these real men seeking comfort in football games, pornography, movies, video games. There are only appropriate ways we think we can get comfort, but the comfort was supposed to. It was designed by God to come through your parents. Then we get to the teenage stage of life. And we would expect as a teenager you would know how to come to your parents for comfort. They would not need to constantly try to comfort you. It's it's up to you to go get comfort when you need it. In the adult stage, not only should we be able to find comfort ourselves, to receive comfort from God, but we need to be able now to comfort others. An adult receives the comfort And someone else who needs comfort, someone else who's crying, you don't have to make them stop. You don't have to say perhaps what was said to you. um, Oh, you'll find another girlfriend. Oh, you'll find another boyfriend. Don't worry, it'll go away. Just trying to make them stop because you are uncomfortable with someone who needs comfort. You, You have no idea how to comfort them which can be as simple as just sitting with them, touching them, telling them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just sitting there. And then perhaps after a time, being able to say, you know, I bet Jesus knows something about betrayal and rejection. Taking the comfort, not saying, oh, let's go to a movie, let's go shopping, being able to point them toward the proper, the true source of comfort. So how does God feel? How does God feel about comforting you? What what is his, I mean, is he saying what some of our parents said? Stiff upper lip, stop your crying. Let me just read a few verses and try to get the impact of this. Christmas time, we sing Handel's Messiah, which opens, comfort ye. Comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. What a beautiful, beautiful example from Isaiah 40. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31. We see God now, Moses is speaking, and he's telling the Israelites something about God, and I want you to to hear this verse. You have seen, this is Deuteronomy 131, you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. The Lord God carried you as a man carries his son. So God is this father, like a man carrying his son. He's telling for 40 years in the wilderness, For 40 years in the wilderness, he carried you as a man carries his son. Interestingly enough, God is not satisfied to say, I can provide a father comfort. Listen to this verse out of Isaiah 66, 13. As one whom his mother comforts, 
so I will comfort you. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. God can comfort like a father. He can comfort like a mother. Many people see that as little, some differences there. The mother typically provides emotional, nurturing comfort. The father can provide often a a stronger comfort. Hey, I know you fell down, but you can do it. Come on, come on. That's my boy, that's my girl. Let's try again. Then the verse out of 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Listen to how many times the word comfort is used. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort others with the comfort that we have received from God. God of all comfort. That's how he wants to be known. Well, when Jesus was here on earth, what did he, how did he see comfort? There are many verses, but John 14, 18, he has this incredible statement. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. What is characteristic of an orphan? Is there anyone to comfort an orphan? That's why we call them orphans. And many of us have what we call an orphan spirit. There's no one to comfort us, so we have to run to the refrigerator, to our ice cream, to our show, to that person maybe who's not so healthy for you, or out shopping, whatever it is that you have to use for your comfort. Lastly, the verse I want to give is Matthew 23, 37. Jesus has lived almost three years now on earth. He's been arguing with the Pharisees. They don't like him. And he says something very, very interesting. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You can just hear his lament, his heart cry. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to you. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings, but you were not willing. Do you see the comfort that he wanted to bring to Jerusalem, to Israel, to his people? I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks under its wings. I wanted to protect you, but you were not willing. And that's what we want to look at now. I imagine if you would have asked the crowd that Jesus was speaking to, how many of you would like comfort from God? I bet all the hands would have gone up in Jesus' audience. So what is he saying? You were not willing. There's something, there's a difference between what they think is comfort and what you think is comfort and what God thinks is comfort or how you're going to be receiving that comfort. And that's what we want to look at now, the difference in how we receive comfort and why we may not receive the comfort that we desperately want. What can block that? Well, if we look at the Pharisees and we look at the people that he was talking to, and he says, you were not willing. What was it that really characterized these people? In a word, I would say, control. 
The people that were rejecting Jesus wanted control. Twice he went to the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers. He did it at the beginning, (laughs) the beginning of his ministry. He did it at the end of his ministry. Interesting, they were still buying and selling. They didn't pack up and leave. They wanted to control their own economics. One of the marks of this control is that I believe all of us want to have our hand on the faucet of our comforts. We want to be able to turn them on and off. We want to get it. I want the ice cream in my freezer. I don't even want to have to walk to the store. I want to be able to get the comfort on demand. The people, Jesus said they were not willing. They were not willing because they wanted to control their economics. They didn't want to allow God to supply their needs. They wanted their own political powers. They wanted to be able to manipulate people. They wanted to be able to badger and bully people. If you want to control your relationships, you are going to have difficulty receiving comfort. If you need to control the relationships, insist that people treat you a certain way, insist that people love you, you're going to have trouble receiving comfort from God. I remember one of the arguments Jesus had with them was that they wanted to be able to get divorced for any reason. If their wife burned the cooking, what, whatever it was, if they just wanted a new one. Jesus argued with them over that. They wanted to control what they believed was their own comfort. And Jesus is trying to tell them that comfort comes from a relationship. Something about control and something about these sources of comfort, they're typically immediate. The comforts that we love, we can get right away. There's a big push to get video on demand and whatever you want on demand, fast food markets. When you want it, we want to have it there for you so you don't have to exhibit any self-control. So food, electronics, even television shows, I want... I want us all to be thinking, really thinking about what are your sources of comfort? Food is not bad. A television show is not necessarily evil. It depends how you're using it. If you're using it, instead of going to God, and you go to God sort of after your primary source of comfort, I'm going to suggest to you that you might want to consider a fast from that for a while. But that is not helping you receive comfort from God. There's a verse in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 2, 13. It's a powerful verse, and you can hear God's heart in this as well. He says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to dig for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. I believe he's talking about exactly the topic tonight. What cisterns are you digging? that are actually broken, they can't hold water. You see, a cistern they would dig and then they would actually plaster the inside of it because otherwise the water would seep into the ground. So they would put plaster, but if the plaster had a crack in it, it looked like it was filling up, it looked like it might satisfy, but ultimately the water leaked out. And with our comforts, The deception is initially they do satisfy. 
It has to do with the dopamine in the brain. Your brain loves the combination of fat and sugar. It actually hits the brain even like morphine, like in the endorphin center. It, it actually has a powerful, relaxing feeling for the body and the brain. It is, I would call it a substance, as far as substance abuse. Ice cream can be substance abuse depending on how you're using it. So trying to get God to comfort you sounds easy, but what, what blocks us? What blocks us from receiving his comfort? I want you to consider, were you adequately comforted? Were you adequately comforted as a child? Were your parents full of empathy? Age-appropriate empathy? Maybe, come on, you, you can do it. I know it hurts, I know it hurts, but you can, you can do it, I'm with you. Or was it more of a dismissive? Your need for comfort is inconvenient for me. Oh, you're so, you, you, I thought we went through this already. You're needy, you're weak, somehow feeling shamed that you needed comfort. You're a baby. Maybe you were given food to comfort you. Here's a, oh, here's some pizza, ice cream, here's a Coke. Leave mommy and daddy alone now. Maybe you were taken shopping or bought a present. I wonder how that might set you up to make you susceptible for certain patterns later on when you needed comfort. Maybe you were given a movie, something to distract you because the parents did not know how to comfort you. And they knew if they could just distract you long enough, they would feel better and probably the problem would go away. Very important point, don't miss this. Comfort always comes through relationships. Comfort, always. True comfort comes through relationships. Now there are a lot of pseudo comforts that you can get without relationship. Some of them are, are appropriate. Exercise, a good meal, none of that is, is evil in itself. But what I'm telling you is the problem with our culture, with us, starting with me and the stories I've told you, is that we're not looking for relationship, we're looking for an immediate, controllable solution to this feeling, when in fact the feelings may be lying to you. We need to be understood and we need to be affirmed. We need to be affirmed. I mentioned already control. Control really blocks comfort. We know that narcissistic people are big on control. They want to control and manipulate everything Narcissistic people are very, very lonely. Very, very lonely. That's why they have to keep all these things going on. In fact, they can't get true comfort. You can't get comfort from a person who you obligate to you to love you. You cannot get comfort from a person who you manipulate and pressure into loving you. Can't, can't happen which is exactly why God the Father does not put any pressure on you to go to him, to love him. This is what I'm doing for you. Here's my valentine. I hope that you will come my way. We must be free to love. The next thing that blocks Relationship, sorry, the next thing that, that, that blocks us receiving comfort from God is humility and pride. If you are prideful, you will have great difficulty receiving comfort and you actually won't even ask for it. In Matthew 5, 4, Jesus in the Beatitudes, he says something really profound. 
He gets up on the mountain, sits down, opens his mouth, and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second thing he says, the second thing, he could, he could say anything, oh, I'm booming here. He could say anything he wants, but the second thing he says is, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You could say anything, and that's the second thing you're going to say. Blessed are they who mourn. How is your mourning? How, how are you mourning? How is, how is I mourning with my ice cream and sad movies? How, how do you mourn? How could we mourn? How could we grieve without self-pity by going to the Father and the Son and saying, do you understand how I feel? Do you understand? Can you validate what I'm going through so that I can then receive your comfort? Don't mistake, don't mistake unconditional love for unconditional comfort. Don't mistake God's unconditional love for unconditional comfort. Somehow we have this societal dictate to make sure everyone is comfortable. You know, sometimes we need to be uncomfortable about certain things that we say, I mean, the stuff that's on television, the sex, the violence, the language, that makes me very uncomfortable. When I tell people, I don't know that you should be watching those shows, I mean, I mean you'd think I threw mud on them or something. It, it, for me to speak truth to people, sometimes the truth of God needs to be uncomfortable. It needs to irritate us a bit. The next thing I want to talk about is repentance. Repentance is important for you to receive comfort. And I want to tell you a story to illustrate this. Let's say you're the mother of two young boys, John and Jim. John is the older, and you have just baked some cookies, and you take them out, and you set them up on the counter, and you tell the boys... It's almost dinner time. I don't want you to touch these cookies because it's going to affect your dinner. If you do, you're not going to have any for dinner. You go away, you come back, you see a little footstool next to the counter, and you notice that one of the cookies is missing. So you go to the boys and you say to John, the older, you say, John, did you have one of the cookies? And he has chocolate on the corner of his mouth. And he says, it was his idea. It was, it was Jim's idea. And Jim says, I'm sorry, Mommy, I just had to have one. And so he's upset. <clears throat> he's not going to have any uh, cookie for dinner. And so you're able to comfort Jim. He's... Um, has to work through this, that he's not going to have any cookie, even though he's, he's apologized, but because you're going to keep your word, you're not going to give him a cookie for dinner or after dinner. John, on the other hand, when you finish comforting Jim, you turn to John and say, John, is there anything that you would like to say? And he stomps his foot and he says, it's not my fault, it wasn't my fault. And he goes into his room and he slams the door. What are you going to say to John? Actually puts you into sort of an awkward situation, doesn't it? You can't, it's really, you want to comfort him as you comforted Jim, who's going to also not have a cookie after dinner. But there's like a difficulty for you to actually comfort him. Why? Because he, he's not taking any responsibility for what he did. If you have gotten into a relationship that there were indications you shouldn't have gotten into, 
if you've gotten into a business deal that went south and you had some inclination that God was saying, not a good idea. When all that goes downhill and you need comfort, God would love to comfort you. But it would help if there was some repentance. Because when we are, I will call it quenching the Holy Spirit, that's actually a very serious heart issue. And we want to come clean and say, Father, forgive me. You told me not to get into that relationship. It wasn't healthy for me. I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. But now I want to receive your comfort. God would love to comfort that kind of a heart. I want to tell you one last story. When you go whitewater rafting, if you go to Colorado and you go whitewater rafting, the guide will tell you to wear tennis shoes or sandals. They'll put a life preserver on you. And they'll give you a a talk. They'll say, you may fall out of the boat in the rapids. It's very common. People fall out all the time. If you fall out of the boat, point your feet downstream, your butt is down, your life jacket will support you. And try to move yourself over to the side of the river. When I see you, I have a bag here with a rope, and I am going to throw this bag as close to you. I'm going to throw this bag as close to you as I can get it. I'm going to try to get the bag within your reach. Grab the rope. If the bag is not within your reach, if the rope is not within your reach, you need to swim to it. You must participate in your own rescue. You must participate in your own rescue. To receive the comfort of God, many of us are sitting there like a baby who everyone runs around and tries to comfort them, but you're no longer a baby. You need to participate in your own rescue. You need to actually get the words of God on your lips instead of saying things like, nobody loves me, which I've had to now go back and repent and renounce, that's a, that's a curse. Say things like, Jesus loves me, the Father loves me. He proved that by sending his son to die on the cross, to be in relationship with me. And maybe you would want to sing a song. Maybe you would want to give him some praise. Maybe you would want to turn some thanksgiving for the things that you do have instead of in that self-pity moment looking at only the things that you don't have. And finally, God's comfort is not immediate, typically. It's not dopaminergic. It doesn't have the same dopamine stimulation, the buzz. It's like a still, small voice. It's possible that if you have the music up too loud, the TV on, the movie's on, that you can't hear his still, small voice. And I will stop there. Thanks so much. We'll start with some questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy. As we're talking about this, um, this whole idea of, of comfort that we must participate in our own rescue, and that God wants us to have a heart of repentance. That story, I've never quite heard it that way, and it's a beautiful story of those two boys had never thought that really it was John and Jim, and there was displacement, so John displaced his own anxiety onto his brother, right? And then at that moment, Jim was able to receive a level of comfort. However, John removed himself. And there is a, an art in the human experience where we individuate. Little children are constantly individuating, and even to the time we expire and go to heaven as a Christian, 
that we are individuating. Individuating is really important where we are trying to, in a way, in a good way, control our world like a little two-year-old that says, mine, 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 mine. And they don't want you to take their dolly or their toy away from them. It's, no, it's mine. I can control my world. Or the sippy cup. I remember Savannah, our daughter. I was taking care of Savannah and Robin was out for uh, part of the evening. And so I was thought it was going to be this great dad. And she had a sippy cup and she had the sippy cup and I got most of the food in her mouth, some on her face, but we did pretty well. And then I turned around in the sippy cup, she picked it up and threw it on the ground. And I turned around, I said, oh, honey, I think you need to keep that sippy cup. Now, she's just a little infant, but little sippy cup, let's keep that on your little plate here, in her high chair. So, again, I'm working some things, and I took some dishes over and put it in the sink, and where did the sippy cup go? Went back on the ground again. So I turned around, I said, oh, now, honey, and then I, I realized my human development studies. I picked it up, and I finally got my mind together, and I said, she's in charge. That's what she's doing. <laughs> She's highly individuating. So I, I said, okay, honey, let's, let me put it back up here, and it's best not to throw the cup. Of course, she's kind of grinning at that point. She wants me to turn around again <laughs> so she can throw it on the ground. And then she's got Daddy picking up the sippy cup, and it's a great game for her. We all love to individuate. So there's a sense where we're almost naturally inclined to control our world from early on. And so that heart that's turned toward God, that heart that is without pride, because in humility we turn toward God and realize He's in charge, that that's the time and the place in which we receive yeah. comfort. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. It's just, I mean, that story strikes me as well, that when you put yourself in the role of the parent, how awkward it is to try to comfort John. Yes. You're, you're sort of stuck. You, you, mm -hmm. you want to, but something really is, mm -hmm. is blocking you. And I think, wow, to, to turn that into our relationship with God, to notice mm -hmm. how he'd love to comfort us, but it's tough to comfort someone who's in rebellion. Mm -hmm. It's tough to comfort someone who, who wants your comfort, who wants to feel better about themselves, but they don't want to move into the truth. They don't want to move in your direction. They just mm -hmm. want to feel better in their disobedience. So there's that balance of being individuated, and that is really, as Ecclesiastes says, it's really good to have work. So it's good to individuate and have the ability to be effective and influence others. That's a need of all of us, yet it's a balance of being obedient uh, to the Lord. I mean, it sounds real simple, yet it's profound mm -hmm. because it's biblically true. Here's the first question that we have. Um, and by the way, if you do have a question, they just raise it in the air and one of our hosts will come and pick that question up from you and bring it to the front. Here's the first question. This year, my wife has a new ministry to the neighborhood. She bakes two pies and gives one away to a neighbor. She mostly eats the other pie herself, which irritates me and the kids. She tends to sleep poorly after eating pie, which makes her irritable. She's surprised that her clothes don't fit anymore. Furthermore, she gets mad at me because I am not surprised. I feel stuck and don't want to lie to her. Any suggestions? What do you think about that, that particular question? You know, the comfort size or waistband. Oh, that's right. We're going back to that. A um, couple issues there. Carbs and sleep. We can take a look at that. When you are... Oftentimes, due to the insulin and some of the, the sugar, mm -hmm. we don't sleep so well. Mm -hmm. we, it, it, initially, we can go to sleep. <laughs> Excuse me. Initially we, can, initially, we can go to sleep with the carbs, but we then often will wake up. Mm -hmm. The problem with sleep deprivation, and doctors know a lot about sleep deprivation, and we crave carbs, mm -hmm. donuts, often coffee, whatever. I love donuts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the problem is that you're eating because you're thinking it's going to help keep you awake, but the body sleep deprived cannot process sugar well. It actually doesn't process sugar as well. It stores it quickly as fat. It doesn't do what you think it's going to do. So you may get a little spike, a little blood sugar spike, mm -hmm. but it's going to have diminishing returns, especially if you're sleep deprived. So you can get into sort of a, a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, you know, another thing we talk about dieting, one of the things I, I, I like to... I'm not a big fan of diets because dieting... I think the statistics say only about 2% of diets actually people mm -hmm. will be able to keep the weight off. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because the diet is, is not your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's a diet. And so as you restrict your calories, your body decreases your metabolism. So you restrict your calories, body decreases your metabolism. It's, it's fighting you. And so you say, okay, I lost the weight, now I'm off the diet, but your metabolism is very low. So I don't like diet, I like lifestyle changes, adding mm -hmm. exercise, mm -hmm. eating less calories. Um, so dieting is, um, yeah, not something I'm a big fan of. In the case of justifying pie eating on because of your ministry to the neighbors. I'm wondering about this couple having a, a conversation about this. Mm -hmm. that, and maybe this is a question we can, we can talk about. What is the role of a spouse in confronting their mate over an issue like this? Mm, yeah. Yeah, in this situation, um, I, I, actually, I remember growing up and my mother would make pies and then she would say, Donnie, I want you to take them to this neighbor. And I still remember watching people receive comfort. I think it led me into ministry, part of just that idea, because I would stand at the door and I'm smiling. They said, make sure you smile. So I'm smiling as I have, it was a pie. And, and then, of course, they would, what they would do was they would, the people would say, oh, Donnie, that's so wonderful. Come on in and have a piece. So I'd go in and have my piece of pie. I still love apple pie today because my mom made wonderful apple pie. She is 92 years of age and very healthy, but um, I think her blood work is better than mine because <laughs> they say that about her. It's like a 40-year-old, but I'm a little older than 40 years. But with this, with relationships, that the key would be to use invitational language. So that is that when I observe this happening, I, when I observe that, I feel uncomfortable and a little bit embarrassed and a little bit afraid. And if that mate could validate that core feeling, you had said earlier that comfort is found in relationship. Without it, we seek comfort, say, in food. I think that was one of the first things mm -hmm. you said. So if we can offer comfort in relationship, in that kind of dialogue, you will download empathy into the child. If that's displayed in a home where there is high validation, there's high empathy, and if there's high empathy, it means that comfort is being exchanged and given on a day-to-day, -day freely basis. Some people say, we'll never fight in front of our children. Well, it's really not good to fight, but we will never fully disagree in front of our children. That is a misnomer because it is actually very healthy to show how to disagree mm -hmm. in an interaction and then show comfort that, that I can stay present with you mm -hmm. in this uh, dialogue. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually interested in what the, what the husband is doing. Is it possible that she's eating, she's creating this ministry outside the home, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if she actually would like some attention from her husband. Yeah. She's getting it from the neighbors, but I would imagine most women would want some attention from their husband. Is it he's just commenting on her dress size? Maybe a conversation, what do you need? What can I do for you? Many of us, because we're we don't know how to receive comfort. We don't know how to ask for it. I know many, many women who won't ask for what they really want. They're imagining the man's going to read their mind, or, or vice versa. Right. Um, they, they, they want a mind reader instead of being able to say, you know, I really would like you to uh, take me to dinner once a week. You know, I really would love you to read the Bible to me, and let's talk about... Uh, what some spiritual things. Could we do that at night? Can you show me attention in that way? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I sense that this woman is 
looking yeah. for something. And you're talking about obligation there. You said that earlier that comfort, uh, really, comfort cannot come by obligation. You cannot really get comfort. And that's why I just ended a session earlier this evening and the entire dialogue was about, would he listen to me? The female saying, would you just listen to me? That would mean, in tears, that would mean a lot to me if you would just listen. So your, your invitation to even ask, what would be helpful? So in this situation, it could be that he would ask, what would be helpful for this pie baking contest that we got going on here? Or, you know, however you want to say it, just the, and, and invite dialogue. How could I respond to you? What would be helpful to you? Because it could be when we get caught in other situations that may overtake our world, maybe this is all she's doing. We don't know that. It could be that if she had some level of comfort from her husband. Value. I mean, many value. women, at, if she's in the home, mm -hmm. taking care of things in the home, many women would feel devalued by that. Maybe she used to yes. work outside the home, now she's in the home. Absolutely. You talked about reading your mind. I've seen this over and over for 30 plus years in the clinical room that women will oftentimes say, I don't want to tell you what I need because if I tell you what I need, let's put the word obligated, mm. then you're obligated to respond and they already know intuitively that's not comfort. That's quid pro quo. It's, it's the idea of that this for that. Mm -hmm. And they're wanting it in a more genuine way. The second question here, if we may go to it, is sure. my in-laws are not nice people. When they come each year, it seems they disregard my wife's feelings and hard work. Their comments are belittling and mean. It takes her weeks to recover from their visit. What can we do differently this year? That sounds very discomforting, mm, if you will. Yeah, yeah. My in-laws are not nice, not nice people. When they come each year, it seems they disregard my wife's feelings and hard work. Their comments are belittling and mean. It takes her weeks to recover from their visit. What can we do differently this year? Get a good therapist. That's what I'd suggest right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like a, a pattern that happens every year. It's that definition of insanity, right? You, right. Doing the same thing. Hoping that it will be changed, right? But this yes. year. But isn't that how we treat our families? Isn't that what we long for? I mean, the, the, the idea of comfort and family tends to go together. Oh, this year... It's going to be that Norman Rockwell Christmas. This is going to be, mm -hmm. this is going to be the year that Dad notices my, all the work I've done. He'll, he'll give me a compliment. And every year they leave. Mm. And the parents have not been life-giving. They have been life-taking. The woman needs to recover for mm -hmm. several weeks. They've actually been life-taking. Narcissistic people are very life-taking. Mm -hmm. You're exhausted when they leave. They're very demanding, belittling, mm -hmm. mean. Mm -hmm. So you're having these life-taking people in your home regularly. It's very possible that the daughter is not going to be able to set a boundary with her father because out of fear, typically narcissistic people, you have a fear bond to them. You bond to them yes. in fear. You just please them. Yes. And the husband now is going to need to be strong mm -hmm. and set some boundaries for his wife's health, safety. But guess what? Do you think this is going to cause a problem if they're not invited next year? <sighs> Are you kidding? It's going right. to be... I well, mean, it's likely to be worse. Because what happens is, there's a, this is a very common experience, and I don't want you to raise your hands, please, but it's a very common experience where what happens is you want to show what a wonderful home you have. You want to show off your children. If you have children, you're wanting to show your dog that behaves, you know, and all of these various things, and you're just very healthily proud of what you're accomplishing because our greatest need, it's the fifth commandment, and it's the one with the promise, so it's a big deal to God. Honor your father and mother, you'll have long life. It's the only one with a promise. And so it's indigenous within us. It's our DNA to want to please our parents. So we're pleasing our mate. This is a common experience. But what happens is if there are unresolved issues from the past, the anxiety of the parents is greater when they come to that home. Sometimes the better the home is. Mm. So the more successful it is. That sounds counterintuitive, but it's, it's fairly common. So setting boundaries is very important in this healthily and as, as kind and as gentle 
as you can be. The key would be to ask his wife, and that is, what do you think would be helpful? Because we probably are likely going to have the same scenario, just a different verse this year again, because this seems to be chronic. And so it's doing some pre-planning. It's how the couple works together in, in, in nurturing a way that there can be uh, more safety, if you will. That may even be, <laughs> this would be pretty strident, but inviting them to stay in a local motel. It, yeah. may, it yeah. may need to be that. Of course, you could have Fourth of July fireworks, yeah. emotions going off with that, but these are some things that you might want to consider. Oh, very good. Staying somewhere else, um, taking a year off. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a family vacation a this year. Like a fast, uh, like you said. Yeah. The, yeah. the thing about narcissistic people is that they... The reason we fear them so much is what they love to do is cause you attachment pain. Yes. Attachment pain. They, the woman naturally wants her father to be her support. So if she does something to displease him, uh, he's going to be very quick to be dismissive. And if there are children in the family, of course, mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to see their grandpa. So there's a lot of attachment pain potential here, and so all that would have to be discussed, but you're going to have to weigh the pros and cons. What I like to, to ask people is, is it possible that you are actually enabling them to continue this personality disorder? You're just fueling their fire. You're enabling them to, to continue. It always takes courage to set boundaries. And oftentimes, it's, it's the opposite. I mean, they've been trying for years to work this out. Mm -hmm. So it's finally at the point where something has to happen. It sounds like the woman's health is failing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the courage required to work this thing through and the amount of energy um, you know, needing to ask God to help you with that, to be mm -hmm, wise, mm -hmm. but to be firm, and also expecting that someone who is going to be receiving a shame message, we don't want you in our home, is going to do their best to get revenge. Yes. They're going to try to hurt you. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem is, do we want to open this Pandora's box? And I can tell you that the answer is, actually, yes, you do. Because God is with you, and he wants you always to act courageously in the best interests of you and the family unit that he's given you. If this man and this woman are not able to stand up to her parents or his parents, sometimes it, depending on the in-laws, uh, they're doing damage to their mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah. This idea of boundaries, and we have just a few minutes left, three minutes left, but real quickly, boundaries. Jesus often showed boundaries. He taught boundaries. He, he really asked the disciples, who do they say I am? Trying to understand the boundaries of who he was. There were times that he would leave a city. There were times that he would uh, give himself time with the Father. He would step away from his ministry. So we see that he oftentimes was setting boundaries. You shared about the children of Israel earlier. The boundary was that he's not going to force his way into the relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. He, he wants to invite relationship. Yeah. And you're the one that said this so well, and that is I'll try to repeat this, that true comfort comes through relationships. Mm. And he died so that we would have the perfect relationship with our Heavenly Father. So I want to, if I can, thank you, Dr. Levy. I look forward to a time when you're able to come back. Would you join me this evening in thanking mm. Dr. David Levy, neurosurgeon, our speaker this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing to have you here this evening, and I'm so thankful uh, for your great uh, skill in, in speaking, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank him publicly uh, for his comfort uh, to my precious wife, Robin, and me during a very difficult season of cancer. My wife is facing cancer. I mentioned that a little bit earlier, and he and his wife, Naomi, have been extremely comforting to us and really create a deep relationship. There have been times where you will call me on a daily basis and even leave a prayer on uh, my, my voice message, always reaching out to us. So I want to thank you publicly. Pleasure. Thank you. For the comfort yeah, which God has worked through you to me. Mm. And our next My Therapist Says, as we close out this evening, 
you'll notice that the next one is Couple Conflict 101, Fights That Can Grow Your Relationship. This is Dr. Claudia Graf Grounds. Um, she is a renowned uh, marriage and family therapist, uh, was one of the leaders in one of the major Christian universities up north, and she's going to be with us and has a book out on this. And this ties into the class that I have taught, my wife and I, Robin, have taught for over 10 years, the Two Become One class, and it ties very much into this Couple Conflict 101, Fights That Can Grow Your Relationship. It sounds like a little counterintuitive uh, title there, but I hope that you will uh, join us for that <laughs> next presentation. And as we close this evening, I want to just close, if we may, a with a word of prayer. And thank you for coming to My Therapist Says this evening. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful knowing that all comfort comes from you. And as we began this evening in prayer, our prayer was really that letter to the church at Corinth where Paul was talking about the mercies of God and all comfort comes from you. And that comfort with which we've been comforted, we can comfort others. And so we're grateful for your presence here this evening. Thank you for Dr. Levy and his wonderful and excellent presentation and the scriptures that speak so clearly, they're clairvoyant in their, percent, their, their, their way of expressing, excuse me, your wonderful love. And so we pray your blessing as we leave here this evening that we would receive your wonderful comfort. And we pray all this in the precious, most holy name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this evening at My Therapist Says.